For the next topic, what I want to talk about is inverse and leveraged ETFs. So first of all, what are they? Um, you know, an inverse or a leveraged ETF is a way for investors to use leverage, which is debt, um, and or short uh, investment vehicles um, in a much simpler way without having to have a margin account. Um, the reason you wouldn't want to have a margin account, um, or at least some of the negatives for a margin account, are that it has higher fees for access to margin and um, also can have increased risk because of the uh, mul multiplicative um, factor of, you know, when you are not uh, winning with your investment. Margin accounts are when a broker allows an investor to trade with more money than they have, which is leverage or debt. And, um, you know, they do this for an interest fee. And in my opinion, this is for most people a bad idea and not worth the cost because, um, you know, the amount that debt increases the risk of losing most or all of an investment is too high for the average person. Um, you know, you're most likely better off not doing it. That being said, you know, your mileage may vary. Now, shorting, which is what inverse ETFs are essentially, you know, trying to, um, you know, you know, follow basically, uh, give you an option to do so. So if you've seen the big short, then you've, you know, you have at least some um, idea of what this is. And in that movie, you'll remember that the people that were shorting were losing their pants, um, you know, when they were wrong and the market continued going up and up and up. And this is a pretty big issue with shorting is what's called short squeezing, where shorts have to pay uh, oftentimes dividends or um, other penalties for you know, shorting something that they're wrong about. And this, along with, you know, just having to have a much better understanding of investing than the average person, shorting is something that the you know, that most people are not going to want to do. So what inverse ETFs do is they give you a way to, if you think that a security is going to decrease in value and you want to, you know, bet on that, then you can do that by just buying an ETF. Whereas with a short, what you would have to do is you essentially place a bet by buying, um, you know, shares of a stock for a current, for whatever the current price is. And then what happens is when it drops, you sell those shares back to that broker and then you keep the difference in price. So if it goes down, you know, let's say you buy $5,000 worth of stock, if it goes down to, you know, $4,000, then you will have gained $1,000. And that's the idea behind it um, in, in a very general sense. The problem you have is that let's say you buy a stock and let's say you short a stock that is, um, you know, $100. If that stock's $100, you short it and that stock goes up over 100% of the value of the stock, then you, you know, will lose your like all of your money so it's the same issue is if you buy that same five thousand dollars worth of stock if it goes up to six thousand then you have lost that one thousand so if it goes up a hundred percent of its value or more you can in theory lose more money than you put in which most people should not and you know probably don't want to deal with that type of a risk whereas with an etf that is shorting the market, the most you can lose is your initial investment. You can lose it at a much faster rate if it's leveraged and inverse, but you'll lose it. Um, you'll only lose that 100%, not more. And that's another advantage of inverse ETFs. So leveraged ETFs, and a little bit more of a deep dive on those. So these are ETFs where the investment manager, so the fund company like ARK in our previous example, is using leverage. So they're the ones using the margin, the margin, uh, can't believe it's not butter, uh, to increase the amount that they can invest in that, you know, those underlying securities. And the hope is that this is going to increase the rate of return. So these, like I said, they carry more risk because they can fall faster or increase faster. So good examples of this are QQQ and uh, TQQQ. So QQQ, and I'll pull this up so you guys can see what's going on with me. So 
when we're looking as an example and we want to see, we're going to go to Yahoo Finance. And we have QQQ. All right. So when we're looking at QQQ, we want to see, let's look at TQQ next to it. Cool. I don't want an Audi, dude. Okay, dope. So, as we can see here, we have uh, TQQ and we have QQQ. Last uh, 20, last uh, trading day, QQQ, which tracks the NASDAQ. So, these are mostly the tech companies, um, the bigger tech companies, that is. It, um, you know, went up 2.5%, basically. And as you can see, TQQ went up. 7.01%. So let's look. 2.32. 6.96. Almost 7.01. This is essentially what TQQQ is supposed to do. It is a daily three times leveraged ETF. So essentially each day it is supposed to go up at about three times the rate of the underlying ETF, which is the NASDAQ index. This is really important to understand because when you look as an example, um, if you look at what they're supposed to do lifetime, they don't always match up, right? So let's look real quick and let's see the difference. <laughs> we have lifetime on here. Year to date total return. Let's look at that just as an example. So with the year to date total return, as you can see, QQQ, which is the underlying ETF, is up 28%. Whereas the triple leveraged ETF is only up 41.47%. This is important to understand because I think just without doing any math, we can understand that, um, you know, 42% divided by 28% is not three, right? So what this tells us is that long term, just because something is leveraged and matches daily, that leverage average does not mean that it is going to long term. There are situations where a leveraged ETF, even though the underlying one goes up over time, will actually lose, um, you know, will actually not gain as much. And a good example of this, I believe, is I'm going off memory here, is uh, SPXL, which is a 3X um, S&P 500 and SPY, which is a 1x, um, so non-leveraged. And so here's an example. We can see the 3x has gone up about three times on the daily average. When we look at the year-to-date total return, our 3x leveraged fund has lost 28% in the last year, whereas our 1x has, granted, only gained 3.5%, but I would much rather take that 3.5% over that negative 28%. I will definitely do a video on this in the future explaining the math, but um, just general rule, you need to look at it and make sure you understand the risks um, you know, involved. But essentially, it has to do with the way that the averages are taken and has to do with the difference between geometric and arithmetic mean, and I think we will. Uh, that's a much deeper topic that we can broach another day. Um, and yeah, so leverage does not always mean good. Long-term average, the underlying ETF tends to do better, historically speaking, and I will have a link for that below going over the math behind leveraged ETFs for anyone that's interested. Now that we're going back away from the screen, um, I think this is giving you guys a good idea. So, you know, if it wasn't obvious, you know, if the NASDAQ goes up 1% and you have a triple leveraged ETF on the NASDAQ, that triple leveraged ETF that day will go up 3%. And conversely, if the NASDAQ goes down by 1%, that triple leverage ETF will go down by 3%. So this is good if you want to try to increase, um, you know, gains um, short term, but definitely something to keep in mind long term as to whether or not that's a good option for you. Now, with inverse ETFs. Inverse ETFs are, you know, they came to the equation when you think that a stock or a fund is going to go down in price. So again, it's much like shorting, uh, but since the investment firm is carrying the margin risk, you won't lose more than you invested. That's the general idea. So what these do is these 
you know, move the opposite direction of the fun that they are tracking daily. Uh, so again, this is daily and not always, you do need to read that, but most of them are, some are monthly, some, you know, they have different specified time periods, but that's why, again, you need to read the prospectus on any ETF before you buy it. So as an example, we'll show you again on the screen and yeah, so here we go. When we're looking at say, I'm going to move this over because I think I realized you guys probably couldn't see some of what I was doing. There we go. Cool. So let's look at a good example. So my examples are going to be on uh, QQQ and uh, PSQ. So let's look at QQQ again. And this is again NASDAQ, ET, uh, NASDAQ index. And then we want to look at PSQ. All right, so PSQ. So basically the way this works is, as you can pretty easily see um, in the last day, uh, day of trading, um, QQQ went up by 2.3%, you know, and PSQ went down by 2.3%. This is essentially the way it's supposed to work. So the reason you would want something like this is if you think that the market is going to go down, um, maybe you want to hedge, maybe you know you instead of buying puts, this is something that you can do in order to try and gain when the market goes down. That's the general idea behind it. And as you know, let's again, when we're looking at these, we can see they're not always going to be the same. Um, you know, it's not always going to be completely inverse, but generally long-term trend, it will usually be the inverse when it's not leveraged. Now, it's important to understand, though, when we're looking at these, that, um, you know, you you can make it be, uh, you know, you can make it a little bit more spicy with inverse leveraged ETFs. So now what we're going to look at is instead of just this uh, PSQ, which is a 1x, like a negative 1x uh, leverage, basically, um, what we can look at is SQQQ. So SQQQ is a triple leveraged inverse ETF. So this means that just like TQQQ, it is going to go up at 3x the rate of the underlying ETF. However, the difference is that it's going in the opposite direction. This is really good when the market when the market or the underlying stock that you're following is going to drop because if it drops say, you know, 3% in a day, which, you know, the market doesn't drop or gain or drop that much in a day. Usually it's going to be somewhere between zero and 3% on most days. Um, and if the market drops by 2% and you have PSQ, okay, maybe you gain 2%. But if the market drops by 2% and you have, you know, S triple Q, then you're gaining 9%, which is a much bigger deal. So, you know, that's a pretty great option. However, we have to keep in mind that if the market goes up by only 2%, then you will lose 6%. So big inherent risk that is associated with this. So you definitely want to make sure you understand what you're doing, but it can be a good tool. And I'll explain some exam some use cases for that later on. Now, another thing I want to uh, try and, you know, help y'all understand is the nomenclature. So Similar to what I was talking about in the last topic, where you want to make sure you understand ETFs. Generally speaking, you can get a good idea about an ETF just from the nomenclature, especially when they are inverse or um, leveraged ETFs. So as an example, with um, TQQQ, you're looking at an ETF that, let me pull that up again. Awesome. So we're looking at TQQQ. Right. So when we're looking at this, generally speaking, the T in this scenario stands for triple. Then the Ultra Pro, ProShares is the company, that the uh, investment firm. Ultra Pro is what the term they use for leveraged. And then it is a triple leveraged. So this gives me a decent idea without even having to dive into the specifics of that, um, you know, of that ETF. I can go and look at the holdings. You can also do this directly through the company. But here I can see, okay, well, here's the different sectors. Here's the uh, ratings that they have on those uh, on this investment. And then here's what the 
holdings are in it. We can see it has you know, these different NASDAQ indexes. We can see that it has Apple, Microsoft, Amazon. This is a good, gives you a generally good idea of what's going on inside of that ETF. And then you want to look at the fund summary and you want to see what's the goal of this ETF. And this is where you can see that, you know, it seeks daily investment results, not long-term. Uh, it's a very important to understand. And that it corresponds to 3X, the daily performance of the NASDAQ 100. Understanding that is going to help you become a much better investor and not fall for, you know, traps of buying like a negative 3x inverse uh, gold ETF just because you think, you know, it looks like it's going to go up. That's it's not that simple when you're playing with these types of uh, financial instruments. Now, another example that I like to show is SOXL for other nomenclature, which just means names. Um, are, so this is Direxion, that's the company, Daily, that's the time period, um, and Direxion does a great job of, you know, making it very simple for people. Um, that's the time period that this is uh, projected for. Semiconductor, that's the industry. Bull, because it's a positive leverage, i.e. it's betting long. And then 3X, because it's a 3X leverage DTF. This is the general idea you want to have if you're just looking and you, you know, this is your first um, you know, just eye test before you actually look deeper at what's going on with that ETF. And it'll definitely help you a little bit with understanding, um, you know, what's going on. And then my other example that I showed previously is SPSXS, which is a S and so again, Direxion company, daily time period, S and P 500, what it's tracking bear, because it's betting that it's going to be going down, i.e. it's shorting, or it is a inverse ETF, and that it is 3x because it is three times leveraged. So this is a general good example of what you, you know, want to be able to look at just from a eye, general eye test of an ETF. Now, when we're looking at these and we're wondering, okay, well, what's the use case, right? Why, why would I use these? What's the point? Um, so the good example that I have personally is in January of this year. So to me at that time, it seemed really obvious that the market was overvalued based on the S&P uh, 500 PE ratio. So as an example, at that time, it was about 26. Um, and it was, you know, historically an average normal times, it should be about 15. Um, PE ratio, if you're not familiar, check out my video on it. But basically, uh, where I go much deeper, but basically it's a ratio of the price of the share of stock, uh, versus the earnings of the company that that stock is a part of. So generally speaking, you don't want to be overpaying for earnings that are too low. That's what this tries to, uh, mitigate because it wasn't within 15, because it was near double that it needed to be, um, by the end of February and was on its way up during January. And it seemed very tied to the 2017 tax cuts. Um, it seemed to me that there was a lot of um, over speculation going on. And this kind of confirmed my view that, you know, you could see that companies were generally using the money that they saved in tax cuts to buy their own stock, which artificially inflated those prices and therefore increased the price to earnings ratio on the S&P 500 index. Then when you consider that, and, and so, you know, in that scenario, I consider reality is going to set in at some point. Then when you consider that at the time, this is again, January, there was obviously a pretty big medical issue going on in China and Asia that most of the people in the United States were ignoring. Um, it seemed really obvious to me that, especially coming from a systems engineer background where I have, you know, did a lot of work on understanding supply chains uh, globally is pretty obvious that there was no way this wasn't going to hurt the U.S. economy, whether it ended up directly affecting U.S. citizens, you knew it had to affect the companies that had supply chains in those regions. And particularly, I thought that this was going to affect semiconductor companies because of the fact that Apple is very heavily involved in, you know, their production is very heavy in China. They rely a lot on those semiconductors and those neighboring countries rely a lot on other Chinese companies. So I decided to, you know, essentially, I didn't want to short 
but I decided that I wanted to buy some inverse ETFs against these market sectors. So what I did was I bought shares of uh, SOXS, which is the triple um, inverse ETF on uh, semiconductors. I bought SQQ because that's the triple uh, inverse leveraged ETF on the NASDAQ, so the tech companies. And then on the uh, SPXS, which is the triple leveraged uh, inverse ETF on the S&P 500. And I did this in late January and sold them um, as the market fell in late February um, in the first week of March. So, you know, as a reality of COVID set in the United States. And now I could have made far more um, if I had held this longer, but that's where the risk mitigation comes in. It, you know, it's again, it seemed obvious that stocks needed to fall. Once they fell a reasonable amount, I realized, okay, you know, I've made what I need to make and I don't need to, you know, I don't need to wait for more and more cream. At the end of the day, you need to assess your risk and know when you're going to get out. And that way I was able to take that money out and then buy more stocks long as they continued to fall each time there was a red day. And that way I was able to, you know, at least somewhat gain during the, you know, downturn and during the turn back up. And that way I was benefiting on both ends. And uh, that's a good use case example where I would use these. The other one would be when I was buying stocks during that time in the fall, then I would occasionally buy some small amount of a triple leveraged um, inverse ETF against the S&P 500 because that was a little bit of a hedge of, okay, well, if the market falls, then it goes up a little bit, even though I'm putting a small percentage of what I'm actually investing in that the amount that I gain, if I gain, you know, if it drops, you know, 7% a day, like it did, um, then I gain 21% and then I can take that 21% and reallocate it into long-term investments that I want that are undervalued at that time. So that's my general take on inverse and leverage ETFs. If you enjoyed this clip, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and check out the full live version of the Wealth for 99 podcast, where we talk finance, economics, and public policy from a working class perspective. We'll see you there.